Welcome back to the course, Cooperative Individualism, the Third Way to the Just Society. We're at Lesson 8, and the title of this lesson is, What I Learned from Mortimer J. Adler. Well, sometime in the early 1970s, a friend suggested that I read a book by the philosopher Mortimer J. Adler titled The Common Sense of Politics. This book, I came to believe, should be read and studied by every college freshman and even high school seniors. I offer Adler's own words to explain the importance uh, of this work. There have been almost no positive efforts on the part of leading 20th century writers to address themselves to the problems of politics in a normative manner. Normative political philosophy has almost ceased to exist and has been supplanted in the literature and teaching of the subject by historical studies and descriptive discourse. Mortimer Adler lived a very unique life because he was a remarkably unique person. At Columbia College in 1920, he absorbed the great books of Western civilization, which, as he reflected in his autobiography, quote, set the stage and pointed the direction for all that subsequently happened in my life. That first year at Columbia, Adler attended lectures by John Dewey, but was less than impressed by the famous professor's ability as a lecturer. Yet, he took extensive notes during class, which he later typed and studied. From this, Adler wrote memorandum after memorandum to Dewey, raising questions and identifying what he found to be inconsistencies or contradictions in what the professor had stated in his lectures. After completing his degree work in three years, Adler accepted a position as laboratory assistant in the psychology department. However, his burning desire to teach philosophy at Columbia prompted him to devote himself to extensive scholarship on contemporary philosophy. Even as a young student, Adler was acquiring perspectives critical of pragmatism and pragmatists, John Dewey included. While still an undergraduate, he wrote a paper identifying issues that pulled him in a direction he had not anticipated. After a bit of personal confession, the paper dealt mainly with conflicts that I now realize have troubled me during most of my career. The tension between philosophy as every man's business and philosophy as a technical subject of interest only to professionals the tension between teaching philosophy as something useful to every student in the class and teaching it as if the only aim were to train another generation of professional philosophers. Adler's intellectual life at Columbia suffered a major setback when he presented a paper titled God and the Psychologists at the Philosophy Conference held in May of 1924. He had come to some of his insights by reading Cicero and Aristotle and their attention to human concerns versus those philosophers who viewed the significance of the human experience only in relation to God or to the cosmos as a whole. He describes the reaction by John Dewey as he read the paper. John Dewey seldom raised his voice or gesticulated for emphasis. I doubt if anyone had ever before seen him explode with rage. But on this occasion, annoyed by my contempt for scientific psychology, angered by the general drift of my remarks, and probably irritated by some infelicious phrasing of the point I was trying to make, he pounded the arms of his chair, stood up, and walked out of the room, muttering, that he did not intend to sit around listening to someone tell him how to think about God. This experience did not sour the long-term relationship between John Dewey and Mortimer Adler, however. Dewey realized the young man still had much to learn, and Adler went about doing so in workmanlike fashion. In 1924, Adler was promoted to the faculty of the psychology department and assigned to teach elementary psychology. His passion was the Great Books seminar he had been co-leading since 1923. He summarized his assigned teaching experience as follows. 
Teaching a course in elementary psychology consisted in assigning chapter after chapter in the textbook that the students were required to study and then recapitulating the contents of the chapter in a 50 minute lecture. Such lectures, it has been remarked, are a process in which the notes of the teacher become the notes of the student without passing through the minds of either. In the summer of 1926, Adler was assigned by Mark Van Doren to review the just published work by Will Durant, The Story of Philosophy. His review was one of just two that criticized the book. My chief complaint was that Durant had humanized philosophy, exactly the thing for which Dewey praised him. His book dealt mainly with men, not with ideas or with ideas only as opinions formed by men under certain psychological or cultural influences. An interest in human beings is one thing, an interest in thought another, and one should not be allowed to get in the way of the other. Shortly thereafter, Adler joined Scott Buchanan and Everett Dean Martin in the launching of the Great Books Discussion Seminars. Fifteen groups were organized in the five boroughs of New York City. Unfortunately, the program was funded for just two years by the Carnegie Corporation and had to wait another decade before Adler teamed up with Robert M. Hutchins at the University of Chicago to relaunch the program. One of the great cultural and scientific issues Adler now began to contemplate was that of human equality. He admitted to an early, quote, addiction to elitism that affected his thinking until his mid-30s, when, as he states, I was able to marshal arguments which, in my judgment, demonstrated that constitutional democracy is the most just, indeed, the only completely just form of government, based not on the assumption, but on the self-evident truth of human equality. Adler argued then that democracies had a responsibility to provide the means by which each person could fully exercise the rights of citizenship. This required not only what he described as, quote, liberal schooling, but continuous adult learning after completion of one's formal schooling. Meeting Robert M. Hutchins, the young dean of Yale Law School, set the stage for a 40-year educational collaboration between the two men. When Hutchins, at age 30, was appointed president of the University of Chicago in 1929, he brought Mortimer Adler from Columbia to join the faculty of the philosophy department. He also began teaching courses on law and psychology. By his own experience in the study of the law, Adler had come to a very critical assessment of the method of teaching and what was being taught. However effective it may be in the training of future practitioners, it is certainly not designed to give the student an understanding of the underlying principles and the non-legal context of the legal subjects he is studying. If the law is to be a genuinely learned profession, then lawyers should be more learned about the law than instruction by the case method can equip them to be. The next step they took was revolutionary for universities of the period. Hutchins asked Adler to develop a list of books to be read by, quote, a select group of freshmen from the entering class. They would co-teach the course with the same students for two years. Adler embraced the necessity for interdisciplinary studies and proposed to Hutchins creation of a new Department of Philosophical Studies to break down departmental barriers and introduce cross-fertilization of scientific investigation and philosophical inquiry. And of course, the old guard would have none of what they viewed as a direct challenge to their status as guardians of specialized knowledge. Worse, Adler was overheard at a private gathering making what he later admitted were unmistakably derisive comments regarding the brand of philosophizing characteristic of the existing members of the Chicago Philosophy Department, who were old associates of John Dewey. 
Then, only months after coming to the University of Chicago, Mortimer Adler put the paper his critical views on the logic and method attached to the social sciences. With encouragement from Hutchins, he presented his views at a meeting of the Social Science Research Council. He need not have gone much beyond his opening paragraph. Current research programs in the social sciences are misdirected and methodologically ill-advised because of erroneous conceptions of the nature of science, which comprise the raw empiricism characteristic of contemporary social science. The distinction between exact science, the physical sciences, and inexact science, the social sciences, is a distinction between good and bad science, not between two different kinds of science. These first years of Robert M. Hutchins' tenure as president of the University of Chicago proved more chaotic than revolutionary. His and Mortimer Adler's ideas to create a two-year honors program for undergraduates was intensely resisted by faculty members. The faculty reaction to Adler was such that he lost his position as associate professor of philosophy and was relegated to the law school. One of his opponents referred to him as, quote, professor of the blue sky, yet he continued to engage in the work of the philosopher. After being removed from the philosophy department, I removed myself from academic politics and turned my attention to writing in the field of law, to teaching the liberal arts, and to giving university lectures on a wide variety of subjects. In addition, I continued to teach the great books with Bob Hutchins. Their decades-long effort to change the very structure of the university and of education generated intense opposition. When a series of lectures by Hutchins was published as The Higher Learning in America, one of the reviews came from John Dewey in early 1937, to which Hutchins responded, Mr. Dewey has stated my position in such a way as to lead me to think that I cannot write and has stated his own in such a way to make me suspect that I cannot read. Frustrated, Hutchins and Adler each considered leaving the University of Chicago for St. John's College, where their program for educational reform was far more likely to be fully embraced and adopted. Then in 1938, Adler wrote what would become the book that made him famous, How to Read a Book. At the same time, he delivered a conference paper on God and the Professors that challenged and angered the overwhelming majority of his older colleagues. He offered his views on why Robert M. Hutchins was not succeeding at the University of Chicago. He failed because he was asking the professors to change their minds. He failed as much with the professors of philosophy as with the professors of science. He failed even more with those teachers of religion who regard themselves as liberal. What Hutchins proposed ran counter to every prejudice that constitutes the modern frame of mind and its temper. The spread of the great book seminars across the country continued. An Encyclopedia Britannica published the great books of the Western world in 54 volumes. Adler's perspectives were having an impact, but outside rather than inside the realm of university professors. How to Read a Book appeared in February of 1940, with sales of over 30,000 copies in just the first month. It remained on the bestseller list for an entire year and was then published in Great Britain and Australia translated into French, Spanish, Italian, Swedish, Japanese, and German. As time passed, Adler became even more concerned that the problems he identified in 1940 had become much more serious. The deplorable fact is that, with the establishment of almost universal schooling, functional illiteracy on the part of a sizable fraction of the population has increased relative to the school population. Even more shocking is the fact 
that an overwhelming number of those who are functionally illiterate because they can read signs, business forms, newspapers, and popular magazines leave secondary schools and even colleges with the same reading ability that they had developed by the time they reached the fourth grade. The reason is simply that the liberal arts, which occupied a central place in the curriculum of the 18th and 19th centuries, have been progressively displaced by progressive education in the 20th. In his autobiography, Adler quotes from a newspaper column written by Walter Lippmann on the significance studying the liberal arts had on the founding of the Republic. At first, it seemed to me odd, for I was a child of my generation, that the men who had made the modern world should have been educated in this old-fashioned way. And then I began to think that perhaps it was very significant that men so educated had founded our liberties, and that we who are not so educated should be mismanaging our liberties and be in danger of losing them. Gradually, I have come to believe that this fact is the main clue to the riddle of our epoch, and that men are ceasing to be free because they are no longer educated in the arts of free men. We have emptied education of rigorous training in the arts of thought, and having done that, we are no longer able to read in any language the classical masterpieces of the human mind. Between ourselves and the sources from which our civilization comes, we have dropped an iron curtain of false progress that leaves us to the darkness of our whims, our vagrant opinions, and our unregulated passions. During the Second World War, Hutchins, a pacifist until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, agreed to make the University of Chicago the facility for the early theoretical work on the Manhattan Project that eventually resulted in the atom bomb. During 1941, Adler twice debated Bertrand Russell on the issue of whether science by itself, without philosophy, is enough, either theoretically or practically, to guide us in leading good human lives or to lay the foundations of a good society. In the second debate, Adler used Russell's own words to demonstrate he could not conclude as he had based on his own arguments. As Adler recalled, He had himself maintained that science gave us knowledge only of matters of fact, not about values. For there to be objectively valid answers to questions of value, there had to be valid knowledge other than empirical science. Such knowledge other than empirical science was clearly not mathematics or history. There was nothing left for it to be but philosophy. Mortimer Adler was moving on to an even larger stage as he became involved with others discussing what should be the outcome of defeating the Axis nations. History and his contemporary experience brought him to advocate for World Federation. There may be many causes of war, but there is only one cause of peace, and that is government. Civil government produces civil peace. Civil peace, positively conceived, consists not in the absence of fighting, but rather in conditions that make it possible to settle all differences without recourse to violence or bloodshed. Civil government, by providing that set of conditions, establishes and preserves civil peace. He expanded on his perspectives in the 1944 book, How to Think About War and Peace. Not long after the war ended, he told an audience, We must be prepared to relinquish the sovereignty of the United States, and other peoples must do likewise, in order to form a world government just as Massachusetts and Virginia and the other states gave up their external sovereignty to form the Federal Union of the United States. 
Years after I first read several of his books and his autobiography, I found myself in full agreement with him on this question. After all, I reasoned, the very existence of modern nation states is an outcome of territorial conquest and in some cases near or total annihilation of earlier inhabitants. Thus, enforcement of any claim to sovereignty by a group of people requires control of some portion of the planet to the exclusion of other people who share an equal birthright to the planet. Adler became part of a committee to frame a world constitution that included Hutchins, Rexford Tugwell, Reinhold Neuber, and other prominent academicians. The result of their efforts was published in 1948. Yet in just a few years, the momentum toward a world federalist organization dissipated. The reason, Adler thought, was the very short memory people have of the devastation of war. Even the growth in the great books discussions began to slow during the 1950s, as young adults sought educational credentials to establish themselves in a career, or sought training and skill areas for the same reason. In the United States, the GI Bill transformed the college student body by removing the major hurdle to higher education, the cost. Lower socioeconomic groups were finally represented on campus. The number of college students nearly doubled in the 1940s from 1.5 million in 1940 to 2.7 million in 1950 as military veterans swelled the ranks. I was also influenced in the 1990s by the next enormous challenge initiated by Adler in the late 1940s to create a comprehensive subject indexing of the great books of Western civilization. He created from the Greek a new term, syntopicon, to describe the two volume index to the 54 volumes of great books that were published. I pulled from the main writings of Thomas Paine, his insights into history, political economy, philosophy, religion, the law, and civilization, creating a subject-by-subject -subject treatment of Paine's wisdom. I completed a similar, if less ambitious, project using the published letters of Thomas Jefferson. Mortimer Adler's capacity to balance a heavy workload of commitments is further expressed by his involvement as a member of the Board of Editors of the American Journal of Economics and Sociology, started by Will Listener in 1941. Forty years later, he explained the need for this journal and the approach he had taken as editor. The decision to make interdisciplinary research the basis of our work was mine, and it was entirely a pragmatic one. I believe then, and I believe now, that the challenging problems of democratic capitalist society can be solved, not by some genius's blueprint, and not necessarily by some current program, but by using the whole range of the social sciences and philosophy to achieve an objective analysis of a problem and an understanding of its rational solution. In 1949, Adler left the University of Chicago to help establish the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies. During the next two summers, lectures were held in the renovated auditorium of the old Opera House, attracting a local audience from the summer residents. The program was soon modified to limit participation to a small group of business executives recruited to participate in two-week executive seminars. As Adler explains, the selections were both historically and currently germane to the considerations of the problems and issues that confront the citizens of an industrial, free enterprise, capitalistic democracy, and especially citizens who also are executives of large corporations. Reading the transcripts of a few of these executive seminars and later having the opportunity to view segments on television I developed a strong preference for moderated roundtables over panel presentations as an effective means of encouraging a penetrating exchange of views on important topics. Participants in Mortimer Adler's seminars were assigned readings that included the writings of Plato, 
Aristotle, Machiavelli, Locke, Rousseau, Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill, and Karl Marx. Sadly, he did not include either Thomas Paine or Henry George in his list of essential authors. With grant funds from the Old Dominion and Mellon Foundations, Mortimer Adler next established an institute for philosophical research in San Francisco. His first project was to compile the full range of philosophical positions on the idea of freedom. A series of 52 films on the great ideas was produced for public television to build interest in the work of the Institute. There in San Francisco, Adler became acquainted with an attorney named Louis Kelso, who had developed the model for widespread employee stock ownership plans as a way to more fairly distribute the benefits of capitalism. He and Adler co-authored two books, The Capitalist Manifesto, published in 1958, and The New Capitalist, published in 1961. Adler had clearly stepped out of the role of philosopher and into the realm of political economy. In the preface to the Capitalist Manifesto, Adler writes, Democracy requires an economic system which supports the political ideals of liberty and equality for all. Men cannot exercise freedom in the political sphere when they are deprived of it in the economic sphere. Adler makes reference to Henry George as one of the group of social philosophers or reformers who provided sound criticisms of the injustices and inequities of capitalism as generally understood in the 19th century. He then, from my perspective, commits a fatal error of analysis by failing to apply Locke's distinction between liberty and license to claims to private property and production, that is, actual capital goods, and claims on those goods derived from landed privilege under law. Adler repeats, but does not address the potential impact of the first reform proposed in 1848 by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. For this message to be effective, access to land would still need to be allocated for private use. The only means of determining the amount of rent a parcel or tract of land would yield is under competitive bidding conditions. The terms of the lease, stipulating what restrictions, if any, are imposed on how land is used, would be factored in when a potential lessee places a bid. Adler simply accepted Kelso's treatment of nature, the, the property in nature, as having the same legitimacy as property in production. Their plan, if adopted, would make universal the distribution of income from property regardless of whether that income is earned or unearned. Under the form of capitalism they sought, nature would lose any distinction as our commons from which private property is derived. In his definitions of natural resources, Lewis Kelso somehow ignored the fact that land parcels in cities exist and that the value of these parcels is directly related to the investment in public goods and services and to population growth. More problematic is that while embracing John Locke's labor theory of property, Kelso includes land as just another type of legitimate private property. He writes, going beyond the original appropriation, it is possible to generalize Locke's theory by saying that apart from gift or inheritance, a man's right to acquired property derives from the productive use of such property as he already owns, whether that is his own labor power, his land, or his stock of workable materials and working instrumentalities. Granted, Mortimer Adler's failure to recognize as a moral principle the distinction between nature as our commons, from which all individual wealth comes by production, and those goods we actually produce, has always troubled me. 
Unfortunately, I was never able to successfully engage in any type of exchange with him on the subject. And this brings us to the end of our eighth lesson.